This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. The final set of substantive tests we look at are those to do with the audit of non-current assets. And here's just a list of the very kind of typical tests which are going to be carried out. First of all, physical inspection. This, of course, allows us to test the assertion of existence. If you can go and kind of kick an asset, so to speak, uh, then it definitely exists. That, of course, tells you nothing about the ownership of the asset. You can't, by just looking at a car in a car park, know whether this is a rental vehicle or whether it's been bought. But at least existence is there. Also, by physical inspection, uh, you will get some evidence, I suppose, of valuation. Uh, So if, when you go and physically inspect an asset, you find it's in a state of total disrepair, it's not working, and obviously will never work again, uh, then you you know, should be thinking of, should I write down the value of that asset to its uh, economic value? Additions. Uh, additions need to be looked at. Remember, uh, very often non-current assets, there will be very many movements during the year compared to the purchases of raw material. But quite often, whatever movements there are, uh, are going to be fairly material. Buying new machinery, new vehicles, new computer equipment and so on is likely to uh, uh, be prima facie material and could lead to material misstatements. Additions are easy. You check into invoices. Make sure that the invoice, you take out the sales tax as appropriate. Make sure if you're dealing in the UK that the VAT element uh, is kept in because in the UK VAT is not a recoverable amount. Uh, of VAT on cars is not uh, recoverable as input tax. Disposal. Uh, Disposal of uh, assets. Uh, If we take the next two together here, major disposals of assets is something, and indeed major additions of assets, uh, is something which should be noted on the board minutes. Uh, A major addition of an asset is likely to suck up a lot of cash. Uh, You know, it's, it's really thinking, where should we be investing our precious cash? And it's almost certainly something the board uh, will approve over a particular level, if you like, of value on the acquisition. Similarly, major disposals, disposing certainly of land and buildings, premises, is almost certainly going to be talked about at board meetings. And when we dispose of items, it would be nice to know how we dispose of it. What evidence is there that we got a good price for these? Uh, can we see the cash coming in uh, against that disposal? Have they accounted for it properly? You may remember from your bookkeeping that accounting for a disposal of a non-current asset it, it's, it's not tricky, but it takes a little bit of care. You have to make sure the cost comes out of the cost account. You have to make sure that the accumulated depreciation comes out of the depreciation account. You put both of those into a disposal account. You put the receipts into the disposal account and you work out the profit or loss on disposal. And again, with uh, often the purchase and sales of non-current assets being relatively rare, uh, it's something that the accounting, this disposal accounting, is something that accounting staff might get wrong uh, because they're simply not practiced at it. Scrutinise the repair and maintenance account. Why do we do that? Well, uh, you again may remember from your introduction to bookkeeping, uh, these kind of problems uh, is a certain type of expenditure, is it an addition to a non-current asset or is it the repair of a non-current asset? And if it is something which is done just to sustain its kind of operating capacity and its revenue generating ability, it tends to be a repair. If it's something which enhances, which increases the revenue generating capacity or the use of the asset, it tends to be an addition. And of course, it's very easy to get these mixed up. Uh, What you don't want are items which should have been capitalized, written off to repairs and maintenance. Uh, This might be done deliberately. It might be done to try and keep the profit down because if you keep the profit down, of course, the tax will stay down. Sometimes it'll go the other way. Sometimes people, instead of writing off an expense, which is a repair, they may prefer to treat it as an addition 
to non-current assets because then it is not expensive, will build the profit up a little bit if they want to show better results. Sometimes they just get confused. They don't know where to put it. Reperform depreciation calculations. And this is not something which can be done uh, by simply taking the total balance, let's say, of uh, computer equipment and multiplying by 20%. Uh, in other words, depreciating over five years. Some of this uh, computer equipment may have been fully depreciated. And what we have to be careful about when we're doing depreciation is to depreciate each asset individually and to stop depreciation uh, when you get down to a zero net book value. As I said earlier, this, this can be an awful lot of work. You can, of course, test some assets on a, a random sample basis to, to see that they're handling the depreciation properly and stopping it when they should. But it's something which is also maybe tailor-made for computer-assisted audit techniques. We can go through all of the non-current assets and re-perform the calculation of each one's depreciation. As part of this, we should also make sure it's not written down here. Uh, it's normal for uh, fixed assets uh, to be entered into what's called a fixed asset register. Uh, it used to be every non-current asset had a, a card of its own. It would say, describe the assets. Sometimes the assets are given serial numbers so you know which one you're talking about. It would say its cost, where it was bought from, when it was bought. Uh, it would have a, a spaces in it for, yes, it was physically inspected on a certain date. And then you keep a kind of running total of what the depreciation was. So each non-current asset had its little card, its little detailed entry, and these should reconcile to the total figures that are going to be appearing in the uh, financial statements under non-current assets. We also have to look at documents of title. We have to look at the ownership of these assets. And if we're claiming that something is owned, uh, then we want to be able to prove that. How do you know, for example, that last year, let's say, they had five buildings in non-current assets. How do you know that one of them hasn't been sold to somebody and now the company is simply renting it back uh, to enjoy the occupancy? The building looks exactly the same. It hasn't changed. You may pick up rental payments. You may happen to pick up a big receipt coming in on the sale of the asset. Uh, but one of the ways in which you'd also be uh, verifying ownership, uh, which is basically rights and obligations, is to identify or inspect the documents of title. And finally, although we're merrily going along with most of our assets simply depreciating them at whatever the accepted rate is, uh, we always have to uh, bear in mind that uh, non current assets should be valued at their fair value. And the fair value, to get the fair value, you should be uh, really looking at the lower of the cost and the net realizable value uh, compared to the economic value. So uh, the economic value is the value that this asset will generate through future use. So if its net book value, its carrying value, is 10,000, but really the asset's only ever going to generate about 5,000 of income, you have to write that down to the 5,000 with a sort of accelerated depreciation 